Welcome to Infinity. I'm Charlie Serafin. Tonight we'll be talking about the power of sound and music. Our guest is Stephen Halperin, a pioneer in the field of New Age music and sound research. He's a composer and musician and the creator of a collection of music called The Anti-Frantic Alternative. This music is being used in hospitals, at cancer research centers, and by psychiatrists all around the country. Stephen, welcome to Infinity, and what in the world is anti frantic alternative. Well, the kind of music, Charlie, that works on a different level and a different spectrum of energy, as it were, than traditional music. And that's why we have a word like anti-frantic. Most of the music that we get a chance to hear in our ordinary society type music is based on certain principles of rhythm and certain uh, compositional principles of uh, melody and harmony. To sing just a little bit of a scale, if we have the familiar, the do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti. Most people are already unconsciously projecting that final re uh, resolution tone, the final do. Well, what happens with most music is unconsciously we've been uh, culturally conditioned to anticipate into the future what's going to happen in music, in sound, in chords, in melodies, in harmony. So what happens if we get hung up projecting into the future, we are literally made tense waiting for the resolution of these different uh, systems. What my music has, has discovered, and what I've discovered in my own work, is that we can be in the now, in the present tense, in the present relax, by doing away with that kind of rhythm, by doing away with that kind of, of uh, harmony and built-in melody, to just focus on the music itself, the tone, the tone of the music, and the uh, uh, somewhat more randomly organized um, aspect of, of the music that allows the body rather than uh, focusing on the outer realities, to, to pay attention to itself and to use the music in a uh, more holistic fashion, uh, more right brain rather than left brain, not analytical, more uh, just being the music. If someone had lived in a cave for the last 30 years and had not been exposed to any of the music that we consider traditional music, could traditional music have the same effect as your anti-frantic? Uh, a good question. The answer is no. Again, for some of the same factors, one of the most important things to realize is that the human body is literally a human instrument. And by that I mean our bodies resonate automatically to the sounds around us, whether they be the noises of this little ticking clock or the buzz of the electric lights, the refrigerators, jet planes, etc., or the music. When we're talking about music, we're talking about, for instance, the rhythmic component. The drum beat and the rhythm in most music is what grabs most people immediately. So what happens is your heartbeat will be literally rhythm and trained by the rhythm, rhythms of classical music, whether they were, you know, uh, the fast or slow, that would still be affecting that individual. It would be outwardly manipulating the listener in a way that um, is very directive. What, I, what I've done with my music is to establish a musical gestalt that is non-directive, that if anything has a rhythm more of the breath of a relaxed breath, and that taps into a whole body of uh, literature and, and medical research that has established that the body, this human body, has, has a, a tuning resonant frequency that happens when the body gets balanced, gets relaxed. It tunes into its own natural tone and tune. And most everyone has uh, an eight cycle per second basic biological tuning that when the body is given a choice, the body taps into. So on that level, if you came out of the cave, you would still uh, relate to music on the, on the physical uh, relationship of resonance, of what's happening to the heartbeat, no matter what the cultural um, thing, and yet how many people have been living in caves. Can we assume then that the body and mind that are in tune are making music, and the tense person who is not in tune is making noise? Is the distinction between music, music and noise applicable? Yes, uh, I, I'd go along with that. Again, I would also point out, however, that one man's music is another man's uh, you know, noise. And millions of people go out and buy punk rock music and call it music, and, and people get very rich on that. <laughs> and very few people, perhaps, who are listening to this program would agree that that is music. And yet, uh, those same people would say that classical music is not music. And there are people who say that the anarchic music and, and certain classical composers uh, or professors of music, shall I say, uh, have said that the anti-frantic music is not music because it doesn't have rhythm and harmony and melody. 
and we're not even dealing with the aspects of dissonance, with which is what much of music has. I would point out, though, that uh, two-thirds of the world's music is not based on Western European compositional techniques and does not have rhythm and harmony and melody in the same way that the uh, traditional, quote, traditional Western European music does. I'm fascinated by this concept of body music, and I'd like to get back to that. What kind of research has been done, have you done? How do you know these things? You're suggesting that the body that's in tune is giving off what did you say, eight cycle per second, right, per second. How do you know that? Some of the research... I can't hear it. Let's put it that right, way. Right, okay. <laughs> Some of the uh, most fascinating research I've come across, I came across when I was doing my graduate studies in uh, the early 1970s. The man who was our essential guru and teacher with that was a man named Itzhak Bentov. A years later came out a book called Stalking the Wild Pendulum, and he had tuned into certain other medical research that had established that uh, both if you uh, take little seismographs, little ballistocardiograms, and put them on the body, you can measure resonance and micro-motion in the body. And also, if you uh, take a look at what's happening between the heart and the blood going out of the heart, up the aorta, into the, uh, the spinal, and into the, uh, top of the uh, top of the head, that usually what happens is you get a very random uh, splattering of blood going all through the arteries and veins. When the body gets relaxed or in times of great stress, such as drowning, the body snaps into its most efficient energy parameters. And what happens then is the blood goes out of the heart at the same rate that it comes back on in. And this regularity sets up a tuned thrust and a tuned flow of blood, which then establishes a certain uh, frequency in the body. And that's where the eight cycles per second comes from on the body level. Also, as you know, the eight cycles per second is what we get into when we get into deep alpha and uh, deep relaxations there. And most, most significantly, there is a reflective layer of the ionosphere, known as the Schumann resonance layer, which is what's making possible this radio transmission to other parts of, of uh, the world, that when we take a look at the cavity of air between the Schumann layer and the crust of the Earth, also pulsates naturally at eight cycles per second. This is as if the Earth itself has a brainwave. So can we assume that there was a time when all human life was in sync with yes. these natural vibrations of the earth? Very definitely. Okay, and the industrial age, if we can uh, find a culprit, let's just pick one that's uh, been that's <laughs> the one. beaten off, and the, indu the industrial age has, has uh, knocked us out of sync, so to speak, by Precisely. all the sounds, including the clock, which is clicking in the background, which may not be picked up on the microphone, but I can certainly hear, and it probably bothers you too. So is there anything that we can do as human beings, and is that the point of your compositions and your music to get us back in harmony with nature? Yes, very definitely. Um, the last part of the question also answers part of the first part. One of the things that I recommend in my book and in my workshops is that people get out in nature, uh, walk in the woods, get near the ocean, and that's traditionally and, and always been and always probably will be something that helps get us balanced, gets us back tuned. And yet, there are always jet planes flying overhead. It's so hard to get away from aspects of the modern day society that we never experience true silence. And certainly if we're working in the city, if we're in a control room here or in a car, you can't go out and walk around right then. You can't get out and walk in the middle of traffic. What do you use to balance in, in real life, shall we say? And that is one of the, one of the real uh, benefits that I found from listening to some kind of uh, background music, relaxing music, that is able to allow the body to tune into this uh, eight cycle uh, pulse, this uh, Schumann resonance layer, or whatever we want to call it. Um, there's uh, a whole field of music, was kind of called the whole New Age music field, that is at least, if not addressing itself to that aspect of balance and healing and harmony, at least uh, having things that other than the aggressive uh, kind of mentality of, as we find in most rock music and uh, the intellectual music of uh, certain other kinds of, uh, of, of genre. The, the beauty of it is that for the same reasons that noise and many other things will tend to keep us out of tune and dissynchronize the hemispheres of our brain automatically, uh, we resonate on a cellular level to sound. Music that is in harmony with the way the body wants to be resonated will get you in harmony automatically. And this will happen whether you're listening as foreground music or background music. When you opened up the, uh, the program, you mentioned the music is used in hospitals and, and educational facilities. It's also used in a lot, of, a lot of living rooms, automobiles, and bedrooms, and dining rooms, and restaurants now uh, as background. And of course, people also, I also certainly recommend listening and listening to the music itself, and not just having it on as background, but actually focusing on the music 
Well, at which point a very different thing happens. You become the music. You get a chance to uh, move into the spaces between the notes because I don't fill up all the space. I leave space for the listener to actually be a participant uh, and to play a duet with the listener. Let's set that aside for just a second, the conscious uh, involvement in the music, and let's talk about the subliminal. We know from research that's been done that people have used visual imagery, the little millisecond insert uh, in a motion picture that would g make you hungry and want to go out and buy popcorn and that sort of thing. Uh, it's been outlawed on television, uh, and there's some controversy as whether or not right. it still takes place or not. But the again, it's a millisecond, something that your conscious mind can't focus on, but subconsciously sets something churning to motivate you to do something or rather to take some sort of action. Does your music and do other types of music operate on that subconscious level? Now you've talked about the calming impact. You don't have to consciously focus on the music to get in tune. It, it can help toward that end. But what about the, let's talk about the culprits and villains of the world. How are they using sound and or music to disturb the natural cycles? Okay, I'll, I'll answer that specifically and then we'll talk about um, the overall question which is music as a carrier wave for consciousness. So we'll remind to get back to that. Okay. The, the, first, the first answer to that is that yes, there are people who have been manipulating us for years. This is virtually the name of the game in, in the music industry. Some of the manipulation is done with what is called the hook in music. Now, uh, when we hear that a song has a catchy phrase or catchy um, chorus or something, we say that the song is a hook. Well, literally, we find that the rhythm of much rock music has a physiological hook. The short, short, long, the dum dum ba, dum dum ba rhythm is an opposite rhythm to the natural pulsation of the heart. This confuses the heart at first and then overrides the natural integrity of the heart and switches the polarity, as it were, of the body. Well, this means that the body is shifting gears and it's a somewhat unstable situation and it's a very manipulative situation. And if you have it going on for a long enough time, it will be an addictive situation. And one of the ways that we have, uh, whether we use the word subliminal or just a very effective sort of thing going on in the whole field of music, is the whole transmutation of what is natural body rhythms into what is uh, at first uh, post-industrial rhythms and now uh, opposite to natural rhythms. We get people, it's like eating a lot of sugar, the hypoglycemic response. And what happens, you get this um, addictive response to a lot of the rhythms. Now, there are two other things that have been making news lately. One, of course, well, this thing with the, the rock music as uh, the stopped or deadly anapestic is weakening this rhythm is weakening to your muscle strength. It'll literally make you more fatigued. It may seem like you're getting more energy because you get juice for a while, but it will, uh, in the not too far uh, distant future, in, in the after a few moments or something, weaken the body. And indeed, many people, even if they like the music, get weakened if we use electronic strain gauges and muscle testing, weaken the body immediately, which is a real interesting uh, contradiction. We think it's strengthening you, but actually it's weakening you. Uh, and until we have more research and more people seeing that that is the case, people won't believe it unless, unless they've seen the test themselves. Okay, so that we should put some kind of a uh, caution on our uh, rock music albums that says uh, this music may be hazardous to your health and the muscle Surgeon strength. General, precisely. Okay. Uh, I would like to see some of that. I, I've noticed also, and uh, I've, I've been involved in some court uh, litigation where I was a consultant where people have come out of rock concerts and they have been uh, so discoordinated by what went on at the, at the loud volumes of the, of the music that their uh, sensory apparatus was, it was impaired, their reflexes were slowed down, and they didn't see someone, they ran over somebody. Or we know if you're driving uh, and listening to rock music, you might have your foot more uh, heavily on the accelerator. So there might be, uh, if you're prone to speeding, you might want to change the kind of music that you're listening to. These are things w which we're playing around with as, as uh, at least potentials for research and topics that people need to consider rather than to, and this is not to say that rock is bad, by, by no means. I mean, the musicianship in a lot of rock music is excellent. Some of the arrangements are great. I mean, I listen to it at times, but I, I pay attention to when I'm listening, uh, what volume I'm listening to, how long I'm listening. I mean, all these questions of dosage and, and um, whatever are significant. It's not just something I'll put on in the background and, and assume it has no effect on me, because I know it does. You now, talked about, let me g jump on that real quickly. You talked about effect of this, the various types of music. Is it an immediate effect? The, why you're listening to it, it's weakening your muscles, or is it a cumulative kind of thing? Somebody who's listened to rock for the last 15 years, are they more susceptible to these uh, uncontrollable urges to drive faster and all those other things? And could we use that kind of programming, let's say, for a small child? If you played uh, 
contemporary uh, or classical music, let's say, for a young child and infant growing up? Are they likely to develop uh, the same way as if you played rock music or if you played your uh, anti-frantic music? The answer to the first two questions is yes, yes. Uh, okay. In other words, uh, the immediate response is weakening and the cumulative response will be typically more weakening, except we find that some people go through what is called a switching phenomenon, at which point what, bec what was at once weakening is now strengthening, and they're operating like 180 degrees out of sync, and that's how they're able to deal with it and go on, and, and it's like, okay, for them that's natural, but there is a cost that is extracted from the health of the body, and we don't know how much extra coffee or how much extra chemical stimulants they will be taking, how much extra disease they're taking uh, and prone to as opposed to what they would be if they weren't doing that. And it's a very hard question. We don't have studies done on that yet. But these are topics that cannot be ignored anymore is, is, is my orientation to that. Um, some of the other questions that you asked, uh, I've forgotten. The uh, development of a, of a child and the type of music, uh, programming a child, let's say. Okay. Okay. Um, that would be useful. When I was teaching in, in the Palo Alto school system, we found that some of the only people who, uh, and these are fourth, fifth, and sixth graders who are open, and this was a, you know, just an intellectual openness to any kind of music, were people who had listened to classical music. And obviously th there was a very uh, strong family influence as opposed to just listening to, cl uh, to rock music. I mean, uh, I found kids who would not even listen to anything if it wasn't rock music. They were, they were so tied into that. And again, classical music by no means is, is all safe. The same piece of classical music uh, will have a, a markedly different effect depending on who's playing it, which interpretation, which performance, whether it was recorded digitally or by analog. All these things we're finding are major, major variables. The, the earlier question then was uh, that you asked also, I think, related to what is uh, called backward masking, which is the suggestion that certain rock records have uh, shall we say, satanic messages embedded in them if you play them backwards. Well, th there's probably more legend on that than truth, and, and we know that some of that does go on. Uh, one just has to look at the cover of uh, groups like Kiss and Black Sabbath to see that the demonic satanic imagery is, I mean, it's like Halloween, you know, every day of the month uh, out there. So there's no question that's part of what they're feeding into. Junging in ar archetypes is more than just uh, satanic. But the other thing w we know that uh, there was some work ap apparently done years ago with not putting something backwards. You wouldn't have to play the record backwards. They put some sounds backwards very low in the music that said, buy this record. And there were some things that had some very strong sexual suggestivity in it, and these were songs that became big hits. And then uh, we found that maybe this wasn't happening anymore, and, and maybe it is, but no one really knows. Can you give me an example of a big hit that has some of that subliminal... I sure can. Going on. Uh, based on the work of uh, Dr. Wilson Brian Key, who did a lot of research on this, the uh, the song "Hooked on a Feeling" had what sounded like cavemen in the background going "Who goes so go? Who goes so go?" Well, they were actually saying something and asking a question that the "Hooked on a Feeling" answered, and it was very sexual. And even if you didn't know what they were saying, it sure felt good, and you reached for that record. Okay. Now uh, we're coming back, if we would, to, to the the general uh, concept, which is even more important than someone sticking in some of these. Uh, sneaky uh, uh, production oriented uh, modalities and those you sneak these after you've done the music and that is that all music I don't know of any music that really isn't a carrier wave for consciousness and this is something that I found very few people talking about very few people even uh, considering the possibility but where the consciousness of the composer or performer is when he or she is composing and playing gets translated to the listener. So if you are being very aggressive uh, and uptight when you're playing, that will be transmitted to the uh, listener. If you are, for instance, a classical pianist and playing some very difficult piece and you're very uptight about it, that uptightness, even though the music may sound technically perfect, will be devoid of feeling and will literally make the person feel uptight. And the same uh, level, if you are playing a piece of music that is uh, very balancing, very relaxing, and you are very balanced and uh, composed when you're going into it, that will be transcending the music as well as being assisted by the music. I learned that early on in my career, and that's always been, if I, if I am not in a place where I can compose myself before I compose the music, I won't record, and I will not put something out that, that is not coming from that place. Let's go back from contemporary music into the ancient cultures in India and China, Japan, Egypt, to mention a few, they had music and they were very aware of sound. There were certain sounds which were repeated over and over. I, the little exposure that I've had to ancient music is that there seems, to, at least to my ear, to be mm -hmm. a lot of repetition in it. 
um, the concept of mantras and the repetition of a of a sound to uh, I would imagine to get the body in that eight cycle um, per Precis second uh, rhythm that's natural. What did they? What was the purpose of ancient music? Was it did they have a conscious design for what it was they were doing? In general, most of the ancient music, and of course we have just historical records and no recorded records at this point, no way of really hearing what their music sounded like, which is a, which is a great loss. But we know that the, the orientation, the philosophy was that music was uh, used for healing, was an aid in getting people to, into altered states of consciousness that were both uh, religious, spiritual, ceremonial in nature. Uh, music and magic were often uh, the same word. Uh, musicians were priests, priests were kings, um, kings were musicians. Uh, there wasn't the separation of music as entertainment, music as diversement, music as, as healing. It was all, it was all one. Uh, many African nations to this day have no separate words for music and movement. So it was all a very, very natural part of life. Uh, and, and of course in those days when we had so much less sound around us, any kind of sound or music was, was a novelty. And uh, even a simple scale or simple notes on a, on a lyric chord might, might just uh, trip somebody out because it was something they had never heard. I'd like to get away from music just a little bit and talk about other types of sound, if Great. we can. For years, if you tooled, tuned down the, the radio dial and you heard in the background the sound of a teletype machine clattering away, you knew, not, you didn't even have to look at the dial to see you were at, 740, you knew because it was the sound of news in a teletype. Well, the technology has evolved, and we don't use teletypes anymore. We have a computerized newsroom now, which by and large is silent. Mm -hmm. Do you have any ideas? F I'll put the question in two parts. First, what is your reaction to the teletype sound in the background to identify a news station? And is there any other sound that we might substitute that would be uh, perhaps more beneficial for our listeners and still identify us? Okay, good questions. My reaction, again, this is my, uh, my body reaction, which is how uh, I relate to a lot of the sounds around me, is that I don't just think about them, is how does it feel? Uh, those sounds always made me nervous. They made me feel uptight. They didn't feel good. So yes, it might let me know that that was this uh, particular radio station. I would just continue moving my, my knob down, the, you know, down the, uh, the frequency spectrum there. I, I do not want to, uh, in general, I mean, I might like the information, and there's a lot of great shows on it, but that particular sound always hurt. Uh, in terms of uh, the computer noise, of course, the hum of computers and the hum of electric lights. Uh, some people say they don't know the words. Other people, when we know that 60 cycles uh, transduce into the audio spectrum, uh, are sounds that we have around us all the time. The sounds of refrigerators uh, resonate typically in the lower part of the body, in the stomach area, and tend to make people hungry. And one might even wonder whether there is a conspiracy between re refrigerator. <laughs> The refrigerator manufacturers are, are putting a industry. tone in their motors that will make you go to the refrigerator and use them. Then you'll use the refrigerator up and you'll have to have a new one. Precisely. <laughs> and you'll also keep putting food in there. I mean, so whether it's an addictive response or a uh, hypnotic response, I mean, people open the refrigerator and without even thinking, they know there's nothing in there but the sound. Well, the sound, again, is a hook. It grabs us. In terms of uh, uh, an identifying uh, sound logo for a station, um, that is good for the people. Well, you know, again, some of the concepts that we talk about in sound uh, today, uh, as background, the music doesn't space people out in general. The music, uh, this anti-frantic music, will be relaxing without spacing out. Now, there's music if it has a lot of drone in it. Now, mantras, for instance, anything that is repetitive uh, tend to irritate most people. Now, the people who like Indian music can go for days on those, but people who don't find them is like sitting on a musical tack, particularly if, if it's the wrong key for them. Uh, but things that, that kind of wander around uh, or perhaps might be some sort of interesting little uh, chord or harmonic might be a way of being pleasant and yet identifiable. And that might be something we talk about you know, after the program. Okay, maybe we'll see if we can commission you to compose some bit of music that will make people aware that it is news and information so that they won't space out or, mm -hmm. or uh, lose their consciousness of what it is that we're trying to communicate, but at the same time find some relaxation. Can sound, you talked a little bit about it, and I'm not sure that I would go so far as to admit that the refrigerator manufacturers are aware of the impact of the sound of their motors on uh, people's uh, stomach, but can sound actually be used as a weapon? Oh, it certainly can. Uh, again, uh, some of this, this research has been unclassified. Uh, the stories that usually come out uh, relate to something called the sound cannon. 
Uh, there was work done in the early 50s by a French scientist who discovered that by playing a seven cycle per second sound, which actually you didn't hear, it was called infrasound, you felt uh, that sound, if you played at a loud volume, would literally destroy the uh, integrity of an individual. I mean, you, you would melt into jelly. And his first scientist who turned on the first switch, his assistant, his whole innards turned to jelly, and he was killed instantly. So, of course, um, the armed forces picked up on that immediately, and they developed some interesting weapons that would cause men to defecate in their pants. It was uh, developed as a weapon to be used for crowd and riot control. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on one's orientation, the, uh, the effect was also on the guy who was aiming the cannon. So uh, it was not being able to be used because it would hurt the people who were aiming it at the other people as well. So unless they mo uh, automated everything, it hasn't, so far as we know, been, been used a great deal. But uh, very definitely, the uh, walls that were brought down in Jericho were uh, a function of establishing the resonant frequency of those walls and playing that at a very loud volume with a lot of horns, a lot, lot of bugles and whatever and the walls came tumbling down and we know sound can literally sound can build up matter the work of Dr. Hans Jenny has shown that uh, sound can literally create all the geometric shapes that we know and literally can form uh, matter into into objects that we can recognize and sound can destroy in the same in the same capacity what about elevator music <laughs> yes what about it well it's all around us uh, the generic term of course we now uh, might spell M-O-O-Z-A-K uh, but the whole kind of background sounds uh, so irritating for, for, for many of us it they're very manipulative they are a, a, a form of very conscious programming on the part of the programmers of that kind of background sound. And we find that in, in, in elevators, in supermarkets, sometimes some of these are now being used with subliminals, which say things like, uh, do not steal, and, and who knows what else they might be saying. A uh, question of ethics there against using, using subliminals. Uh, musically, we know uh, that is just terrible music, and it, uh, the arrangements are very bland. But the fact that it's manipulative, I find very, very uh, un uncomfortable with. And yet, uh, if people say well, it, it improves efficiency, well, we know that people can be made more efficient by a lot of other ways as well. Many of the sounds we hear are words. We think of French and Italian as lyrical languages, and German and English are somewhat more harsh. Are there certain languages that are more beneficial to the body and these body rhythms that you talked about than other languages? Should we all stop speaking English and, uh, <laughs> and move into French or uh, Greek or Latin or something? Well, <laughs> that's another good question. Let me say this, that the, uh, the ancient languages of Sanskrit, Egyptian, Hebrew, and Chinese, uh, when spoken into a device known as a tonoscope, create shapes in the sand, in the actual uh, physical matter, that the uh, letters of their alphabets look like. And when you say words like OM, O-M, you first get a, a round shape for the O sound, and then when you uh, have the M trailing off in a series of uh, diminishing harmonics, uh, that creates a series of interlacing triangles in sand as a function of the uh, uh, diminishing uh, frequencies of the M as it trails off into silence. So there were, uh, there's a lot to be said for ancient languages being consciously evolved uh, of course, it's hard to go around speaking Sanskrit in, in America, but yet it, it was certainly is a power in words that uh, words do pack a power as well as thoughts. And we're now getting ways to, to see the sound evidence of how we speak and what we, uh, what we think, how it, affects, uh, how it affects us and uh, those around us. This is Infinity. Remember to keep your mind open and listen to your heart. I'm Charlie Serafin. Thank you for listening.